today our topic is data structures for computer graphics. Uh, so how we represent digital, digital models in computer graphics, also how, how we represent scenes in computer graphics for fast ray intersection tests, etc. Uh, so we will talk about stuff like that today over our set of slides again here. Uh, so until now, we uh, rendered digital objects, virtual objects uh, through ray tracing. Uh, and representation of rays were relatively easy. It is a parametric representation depending on one parameter T, I can go to anywhere on my line, on my ray. Uh, and if you're other than lines, there are also other mathematical surfaces like uh, spheres or planes, like again, the ones you will consider in your assignment. Uh, but in general, we are not restricted to these set of uh, objects. We can play with, uh, interact with any set of objects. So here comes today's topic then. How do we represent these shapes in our computer graphics applications? We can either represent them explicitly using uh, a polygon mesh, uh, or we can implicit, implicitly represent uh, those objects. Uh, and uh, in addition to the representation issue, we will also talk about uh, the representation, the organization of the objects in the scene. So triangle mesh, a, a popular way of explicitly representing a model is uh, this idea of sticking together a set of triangles, or it can be any polygons actually, but triangles, uh, triangle polygon is the uh, most popular choice. So sometimes we also go with quad, quad as the polygons in our meshes, uh, but in in the rendering time, in in the end of our uh, in the end of the GPU session, for instance. Uh, you will, we will always go to the triangle mesh because interpolation on a triangle is very easy using these body centric coordinates. It uses the idea of three vertices are definitely on the same plane, but with a quad, four vertices are not necessarily on the same plane. So there may be a plane through those four vertices, like approximating those vertices. That's why it is it is not possible to interpolate values as easy as the interpolation of values on a triangle. Uh, so that is the reason we like triangle meshes a lot. Again, using the barycentric coordinates defined for triangles, we can interpolate any value uh, on the triangle vertices inside of the triangle. We can interpolate them. In general, these values are the color RGB values. But it can be any value, actually. Uh, so a triangle mesh or a, a mesh uh, can. Uh, so it falls into this piecewise representation. Pieces are triangles. Okay. Uh, in this example, obviously there is no triangle because it's a two D example. So my pieces are one dimensional lines here. This line. This line. This line lines are my pieces, uh, linear pieces, just like triangles being linear in two dimensions. An alternative to the piecewise representation, I can parametrically represent the shape, but again, this requires your model to be mathematically definable, like a circle. Uh, then you can use your T parameter in uh, combination with trigonometry to land at a point on this circle or in our ray example, line, then your T parameter will be plugged into O plus DT equation. Uh, but again, piecewise representation uh, is obviously more popular as uh, we don't often have mathematical objects around. 
so peace was here is an analogy between uh, separating domain uh, into piecewise functions like this part of the domain is represented by this constant function six this part is represented by another piece which is a parabola etc piecewise is just like that uh, piecewise uh, mesh is just like that piecewise linear surface is just like that as you increase the number of pieces you get a better approximation uh, of the actual ideal surface so here in the 2d case of uh, representing a circle uh, curve uh, so the dashed line is measuring the error uh, between the ideal pack and your uh, mesh meshes uh, piece as you can see as i increase the number of pieces the some of these dashed lines they just go uh, to a lower values actually here it is over, almost zero um, and in 2d the piece is a triangle uh, so sorry in 3d the piece is 2d so if your embedding space is n dimensional then your piece will be n minus one dimensional in general so here again this is a crude approximation of a sphere but as i have more pieces around i decrease the uh, num uh, the error and actually there is a quadratic relationship between number of pieces and the uh, approximation error uh, by the way, you may ask, why don't we use nonlinear pieces? Why do we stick with these linear pieces? Or instead, just why don't we just put patches? It is also possible, uh, like it's Bezier patches, NURBS, uh, supplies. We also use them, but this is a simple and more effective way, actually, because here there is no concern about the connection points. Uh, so uh, we generally go with the linear pieces. <clears throat> Smoothness conditions between pieces are easy to satisfy here naturally, especially if you have a lot of pieces, then you really see a smooth transition between one piece to another piece. You don't do anything special. But with a, uh, with a nonlinear model, if you use nonlinear pieces, then the way you connect them is uh challenging and you need to do some work on that uh, that's why it is not preferred a lot uh, okay so all these are triangle meshes actually sorry these are polygon meshes where the one in the middle is a triangle mesh because the polygon in use is a triangle here this guy is a quad mesh because the polygon is a quad with four sides here we have pentagons around so there can also be a hybrid of polygons in the, in the in one mesh it is also possible sometimes uh, in computer graphics we don't have to uh, use uh, the triangle mesh although it is the most popular choice sometimes we just use the points themselves without any connectivity so like the robotics applications when your robot is cruising around your room it gets some point cloud data and maybe it needs to perform some segmentation on it to recognize uh, a mug on your table so that it can bring that mug to you in that case you don't really have to get the mesh out of that point cloud so then point cloud representation is all, already a good one the one of the main reasons of going to triangle mesh representation or any mesh representation is the rendering actually uh, you can see the surface you can render the surface uh, with smooth nice colors like the ray tracing we have seen because i need ray versus a surface intersection okay so i cannot do that with a point cloud obviously so uh, the, the mesh or a triangle mesh here enables me to get the surface so i can tell you that like the 
maybe the most powerful application of using a triangle mesh or a polygon mesh is to obtain a very easy rendering. I can get renders uh, on my screen. And I don't have to represent the inside of the model because when you render, you just deal with the shell, the outside. It is also a good trick here. We generally in computer graphics leave the inside alone uh, empty uh, as it won't be visible anyway. But sometimes like a deformation application in this die case, uh, we also fill the inside because if you are doing deformation, then to be more realistic, you also have to model the inside of the object because as we know in the real world, uh, stuff also have uh, inside content and it affects the deformation level. Uh, so here is the tetrahedral mesh as an alternative mesh representation. In this case, the pieces are tetrahedral uh, and they occupy volume uh, rather than area of a 2D triangle. I have now 3D tet tetrahedron in my hand. And the main application here is the formation. This is a sphere mesh. Uh, uh, you have to do some overlap between spheres to prevent gaps in your model. That's why it's not very popular. With the tetrahedron, tet mesh, it is the to go way to handle inside because no hole, everything naturally connects. This is the extension of triangle mesh to 3D actually, tetrahedral mesh. Another representation deals with skeletons only. Like uh, you don't need to uh, process the details. Maybe you will uh, deform only the abstract, the the skeleton which is an easy task to do then you can transfer that deformation to the skin to the outside uh, so that's why skeleton representation is also very popular and common and sometimes you represent uh, 3d models implicitly uh, in a grid so in the grid actually i will talk more about this later today uh, in the grid, we have this color field going on. At every grid vertex, we have a color value. And those values implicitly define your object. They are generally the sign distance function to the, to the target object. So we are hunting for the uh, places in my grid where I have zero distance to the surface, because then I am on the surface. Uh, so coming back to triangle mesh, again, the most popular choice, uh, I can give you several types like uh, a triangle mesh with boundary. So th this is the mesh where an edge can be neighbor to one triangle in addition to two triangles. In general, a, a regular mesh will have every edge uh, touching to two uh, faces on the two polygons on it. Then we call this mesh a manifold as well. So this is just a technical term. Uh, manifold means that your edge is incident to at most two faces. So one face if it is on the border, two face it, if it is interior. <clears throat> so in this non-manifold example here, this red edge is incident to three. So there is a third extension, which is not desired. So we like manifold meshes because they are regular. We have some pattern, like the way we have in images. In an image, given a pixel, there is a pattern. I have four neighbors, left, right, top, down. Okay, so manifoldness brings such regularity to our meshes, which makes processing easy. And the second condition of manifoldness is this uh, disk property. Given a vertex, let's go to this manifold model, its neighborhood looks like a disk, okay? We call it warning neighborhood. Warning because these are the ring 
the vertices that I can go from my source in one shot, in one edge traversal. So it is a disk right here from, for this vertex in my laser pointer, uh, I have a disk patch. But here, this is not a disk. I am missing stuff. This is not a disk either. Like this weird point is connected to above and below. So the uh, around of this looks like a ring. So th these are again, if you have even one of this structure in your mesh, then you have a non-manifold mesh. And by the way, you can also have half disk, unlike this example. Like again, in the border, again, take this point, its neighborhood looks like a half of a disk. So not like this, because here you are missing a piece, then you are restarting again. So this is not acceptable, but this is acceptable, the half disk. Then you have a manifold thing. Uh, yeah, and so what is this two in the beginning? Two manifold is, uh, me, it means that you are dealing with uh, 2D pieces. Again, if you are in N dimensions, then you are talking about N minus one manifolds. Uh, so the way we represent a triangle mesh is uh, like the way we represent an undirected graph in data structures. Uh, additionally, we also keep faces in our system. Uh, like these, these are connectivity, regularity. They, these are all definitions coming from that graph domain. Like the reg degree of a vertex is number of edges coming to that vertex, like four here, four A. And connected, this mesh is connected if there is a path between every pair of two, every pair of vertices, A to K. Uh, D to J, whatever. And the meshes we deal with, they are a special type of planar graphs. So what is a planar graph? It is a graph where you can draw the edges into a paper, into a 2D plane without any edge intersections. Okay, so this is a planar graph, but unfortunately this drawing has some intersection, but it doesn't uh, violate the property of being planar. Because if you be careful, like draw it again like this, you have a uh, non-intersection graph. So this is a planar graph then. And actually we have other names for the good drawings, like this is plain graph, but again, let's not get lost in, the, in these little details. So we have planar graphs. Uh, and our models, our mesh models, because of this manifoldness property, are all planar graphs. Like we have pieces like this all over our mesh. And I introduced this concept because with a planar graph, we can talk about this very famous Euler identity. Okay. It is very cool. Like number of vertices minus edges plus faces is equal to two. Something he observed. Uh, uh, and a very cool thing actually, a very simple formula. And so let's verify it real quick for a cube. I have eight vertices, eight minus uh, 12 edges, right? Four top, four bottom and four verticals, 12 edges, plus six faces like a di dice. Uh, yeah, so it applies to, and so this is planar graph, right? So how do you, buy it you can buy it like this if you like enhance enlarge one of the faces like like the bottom you can project all others here right so this is the way you can see the planarity of this model and you can extend this idea to any arbitrary object right so take one triangle make it huge and project everything inside of it so let's real quick prove why this cool identity works. Uh, this is a proof technique called proof by induction. And it's also a good example of 
this technique, a visual example. So this technique uh, enables you to assume the correctness of your statement for a smaller case. And then you add one piece and you get to your original case and you see that you, the statement still holds. Okay, so this is the mechanism of this kind of uh, proofs. So here I take a graph, like uh, a planar graph like this. This is planar, right? It doesn't intersect any other edge because there isn't any. So for this uh, planar graph, uh, again, the statement is V minus E plus F equal to two. So you don't see V here. I think it is some shift ha has happened, but number of words is two here. So two minus one H plus one. What is this one? One is the face. I have this infinite face. So it corresponds to this outer gray face, right? One, two, three, four, five. And the sixth one is this infinite face. Uh, so it holds for this base case, okay? Then what is the inductive step? Assume the correctness of this statement for a subgraph like this graph, okay, uh, with E edges, then it means that I have V minus E plus F equal to two in my hand. I can use it. Where will I use it? I will use it in this new graph where I have E plus one edges. So I add one thing. Mm -hmm. So what happens here? The number of edges increases by one and also number of faces increases by one because I now have one, two and three the infinite three faces before I had one plus two faces. So in this final uh, graph, I have this condition and number of vertices is still V because it hasn't been updated. I just added this red edge. So V minus E plus one plus F plus one, this should still be equal to two, right? Because this is the number of vertices in this graph this is the number of edges in this graph, and this is the number of faces in this graph. And I see that it is two because here I can cheat. I can use V minus E plus F equal to two identity as I can assume it, that I assume that it works. Uh, so with that, I have two equal to two, a valid statement here, uh, which is enough for your proof. Uh, so, one cool application of this identity, V minus E plus F equal to two identity is to drive statistics on meshes. Like you will see that number of faces is almost double the number of vertices. Like if it is like 4,000 here, F is like 8,000. It is not exactly, but it gives a good approximation. So let's see why it works. Uh, so given a face, again, I am talking about the triangle mesh here. Okay, so this works for a triangle mesh, not a quad mesh. Uh, so given a, so it can also work for a quad mesh because it's also planar, but then these values will be different. You can drive it at home later, but I will now drive statistics for a triangle mesh like this guy. So take a triangle like this, with that, you count three edges, obviously, by definition of a triangle. So then you may wonder that uh, every face gives you three edges, hence E is equal to 3F, a very a basic conclusion. But then a, an observation comes like this edge, B to H, is counted twice, once because of this triangle and once because of this triangle. So this three times F actually double counts. It gives you twice the number of edges. So from here, you plug uh, F equal to two E over three to our formula and you set it to zero. Be careful, it is normally two, right? But since V, E, these are big numbers like in computer graphics, we deal with uh, thousands of vertices and faces, or sometimes millions. Uh, so two is negligible. 
That's why I just set it to zero. Uh, and when you make your left and right equations like V is equal to E over three, then E is equal to three V. But again, here is that approximation mark. Since I have this negligible two, I replace it with a zero. The end result is not perfectly, uh, is not the exact equality. That's why you see some deviations from two, two times V here. But still, it gives a very close approximation. Similarly, E is like three times V. So it is also easy uh, to see that actually we have even saw that here in the beginning. Uh, yes, uh, so we, we have shown it here actually. First, I have shown this equation to you. Now, for f equal to 2v, you just plug what you found above. What is that? v minus e number of edges is going to be what? Uh, number of edges is going to be in terms of f, it is 3f over 2. So you use this identity here. Plus f is equal to 0 again, which brings f equal to 2v. And the other statement is average vertex degree is 6. So like given a vertex, it will be connected to its local neighborhood. And there will be, on average, six other vertices in that neighborhood. So, uh, and you can even verify it on this model. Like, uh, you really, you are looking at, uh, on average, six neighbors. So I tell it on average, because here, for instance, uh, for this guy, it is the degree is three. So it doesn't have to be six uh, always, but on average, it goes to six, especially when your uh, number of vertices is high. So how can I prove it to you? What is sum of all degrees? Because I want average vertex degree to go there, I will, find sum of all the degrees in my system and divide it by the vertices, which will give me average vertex degree. So sum of all degrees come from this handshaking lemma of the discrete math uh, course. It is actually very simple, so you can even buy it like this. When you, for instance, take the sum of this vertex, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you will count this edge, okay? Because it will count one, two, three, four, five, six, and one of this will be counting this edge. But later on, when you add the degree of D, this vertex, you will be counting this again, because one, two, three, four, five, you will count. So you notice that sum of all degrees is equal to the summation of all the edges, but twice of that, because each edge is counted twice. So I have 2e here, 2e over v is equal to 6v over v because e is over equal to 3v. So I have 2 times 3v, 6v over v equal to 6. Yeah, okay, so these are our uh, statistics. Uh, so a good application of Euler's formula we have used here. Uh, now I can talk about uh, the structural, more structural details on meshes, especially uh, in terms of programming. So how do we store a mesh in our program? We will definitely need to store the vertex coordinates as well as the connectivity. Uh, and optionally, you can also store normal vectors at each vertex, color vectors at each vertex, text coordinates, UV coordinates at each vertex, segmentation label at each vertex or any other label. So these are optional, but in a basic uh, well-known mesh format, you will definitely see coordinates followed by uh, triangulation or quadrangulation, whatever uh, connectivity you use.
and uh, we also need efficient algorithms to answer queries like what like uh, what are the vertices of a given face because i may want to interpolate values on that face on those vertices inside the face uh, so what are the triangles incident uh, to a given vertex like the last query here uh, again this is interesting because you need the normal information at a vertex as you have uh, witnessed from your ray tracing days uh, so but how do you get it it's just a point so what is normal of it to to compute that you look at the normals of the planar regions around it. So these are the triangles around it. For a given triangle, I can validly define a normal by using cross product, right? So again, just a recap. So for this triangle here, this is one vector from here to here, and this is another vector. So cross product of these two ve vectors will give you a line perpendicular to this region, to this plane, a plane of the, uh, the plane of the triangle. So that is that, very easy. You can compute normals at each triangle easily. Then the normal at a vertex will be the average of these normals. We generally weight these average with the array of triangles, but still this information is a very classical query. Uh, which edges are incident to a given vertex? Again, maybe you are computing shortest path, like the diagonal algorithm. You want to learn the distance over the surface from this point to this point. Then essentially you have to investigate your edges and select the good one, select the other one. So you can go through all these edges to complete your shortest path, for instance. And in addition to the queries, I can also talk about some operations that are very fundamental in computer graphics, like uh, resolution updates. We can do collapse to decrease resolution, and the opposite is split to increase resolution. So here, if you want to uh, decrease the resolution, you pick a small edge whose loss will not be missed. So then you collapse it, like you collapse the other endpoint on top of the other endpoints, which effectively kills these two triangles in the middle. And these two vertices are just one now. And I can then move it like to the middle, wherever. So this is how we lose information, like two triangle and one vertex is gone. So going to a lower resolution. Uh, and this is important, like, again, consider the table in front of you. That is a planar region. You can easily represent the rectangle here, the big rectangle using two triangles on the right. Uh, so, but if your mesh has many triangles, then you can collapse edges like this and you decrease resolution. Uh, the opposite action is increase resolution, like in a subdivision surface, we start with a base model, then we split an edge, like here. Generally, we pick longer edges, depending on your application, but you split it from the middle, uh, which creates one new vertex and two new triangles. So I have four now, before I had two. Another operation is flip. Edge flip is like this. Every edge comes with two incident triangles, as we discussed before, since this is a manifold. So Philip tells you to connect two unconnected uh, vertices of this region, of this quadratic quad quadrangle region. So why do we do it? If you look at the picture here, uh, we have 
small angles uh, for so degenerate cases like uh, we have skinny triangles like this in our system that our simulations don't really like these are long triangles so it means that some angles are very small so small angles occur if the degree of a vertex is too high because you have this two pi uh, to be shared by the degree so if you put a lot of edges here then obviously naturally you will be assigning small angles to the triangles around you and i want to avoid that so flip is for that action it will regularize your valence your degree like if the degree is too much by flipping this so in this example this edge is flipped into this scenario okay it becomes like this and if you do it uh, systematically uh, you will have this uh, regular you uh, you convert to your regular degree of six right remember we have also seen it one two three four five six okay so these are very uh, fundamental operations in computer graphics uh, and so now let's come back to the structure uh, for our programs uh, like we can go with a face based structure like in an stl format this is not preferred because of the replication issue uh, so a triangle so here what you do is actually you store nine floating numbers real numbers for each triangle because each triangle comes with three vertices and each vertex has three components x y z so nine numbers per row but the verse new series uh, the duplication the replication because as we have seen a lot of times so i don't I, I can just look at here so this triangle is like this in isolation later on when i add this little triangle it means that this vertex as well as this vertex will be repeated again so maybe it is that vertex here and it will be repeated here again maybe here so this is not just a waste of space but also uh, a very hard to program environment because when you move that vertex because of a deformation application maybe you have to update more than two more than one locations in this structure which can be which can generate errors programming errors uh, so what we suggest is uh, use instead of face set structure that we discussed here use indexed face set data structure which is what they use in this popular obj off and fly formats uh, so here you have two separate arrays uh, one is of floats real numbers and one is a set of integers okay which are also more efficient to store. Uh, so I put X, Y, Z of each vertex into this array one by one. There is no replication, no duplication, because these are the vertices in my system anyway. When I design my triangles, I just uh, refer to the index of the vertex in this array. Like if your triangle here is uh, made up of vertex two, five, and six, then I have two, five, six here. Which in the uh, when, whenever necessary, you will get the second vertex from this list, fifth vertex from this list, and sixth vertex from this list. Uh, so this is also efficient in terms of programming because when you for instance update the location of the fifth vertex like again with deformation you don't 
update more than one location. You just update the uh, fifth index in this vertex array to its new coordinates. And then all the triangles using index five here, integer five here, will uh, be handled automatically. So you don't do anything into this uh, array. And there are multiple ways to uh, implement this structure. Uh, so like using uh, libraries around in libigl or sigl, uh, etc. But in my own research, uh, I prefer my own implementation here, which is a lightweight implementation, and it enables you to do almost anything on a mesh efficiently. So what I have in my mesh is a set of triangles, vertices, and edges, right? So this is a triangle mesh, but it can also be made quad easily. So you fill these entries with structures called triangle, vertex, and edge. So let's see them. Uh, vertex is the most uh, important one, maybe. So it has this coordinate information. And these three lines are very important because they enable all these connectivities, all these connections, and they enable you uh, and to perform your classical queries and operations. So triangle list is the set of triangles incident to this vertex. Uh, and again, I am using integer indices to do triangle array that I already have in my system, Tris array. So I always keep integer pointers. That is the trick in next phase set. Similarly, I uh, have access to my edges, to, to the edges touching to me, to this vertex. And also I have uh, access to my neighbors in my wandering neighborhood. Uh, and Triangle, for instance, it has this index value, not so critical. It essentially tells the index of this triangle in this three uh, global array. This is the important part. A triangle keeps three integer address pointers uh, to its three vertices. So these are the uh, integer addresses to the words array. Again, our global words array here. Uh, and uh, triangle specific information like the array of a triangle or other in information you can keep here as well. And I also like to keep my edges uh, as a separate structure uh, because again, for short to spread computation, et cetera, I will uh, use them. It simplifies programming a lot. Again, an edge needs two vertices, but never use the actual vertex coordinates here because it will be hard to maintain, also uh, more uh, costly because integers are uh, light variables here. So I use just integer address, address to my two endpoints. So again, V1i goes to words array and add specific information length. So to complete this implementation, uh, let me also talk about how to fill, fill in these entries because they are very crucial to our system. Uh, so I don't have that here, so I should open the code uh, of that real quick. Uh, so where can I get that? Let me... Uh, get that uh, sample code in the course website. I think I put something. Uh, so let's see this. Um, uh, okay, so I can now share back and it will be this text editor. Okay, so 
remember my task is to fill in uh, the structured structural information like uh, recall we discussed this stuff triangle vertex etc okay so uh, vertices triangles and edges so how to fill them in uh, and also i will show you how to fill these inside attributes uh, so when you read your file we will also see the content of this in the slide when we come back but it is a very simple content it consists of xyz coordinates so you read uh, them out uh, and then so as you read them you just add that xyz as your next vertex and then you read the triangle information until the end of file which gives you three triangle indices like v1i v2i v3i uh, and use them in your add triangle function so let's see these functions this is very simple uh, at vertex it actually does nothing special it creates this uh, object called new uh, called uh, called nothing actually uh, i use the coordinates 3D coordinate based on the current X, Y, Z value, and I edit, no questions asked me. There is nothing tricky here. The tricky part is in the add triangle. When I set up my connectivity, I also need to uh, fill in a lot of attributes, like what is happening uh, at triangle. Okay, so this function. Again, V1, V2, V3 integer indices, uh, I need to keep them like this is triangle two, four, five. Then I have a new triangle with two, four, five. And its ID is if it is the tenth triangle, then I index will be nine as indices start from zero. So now this is the part I was talking about how to set up the structure. First of all, V1 now has a new triangle touching it. So I tell notify v1 in the vertices array so i tell this vertex structure for v1 and 3v1 that this current index 9 is your new neighbor now so this is how i set my triangle neighbors tree list then comes the more tricky part because of the duplications here so i can maybe talk about this like this so like if you have a, a tr triangle, okay, like uh, can I draw a triangle here? Maybe okay, like this, I guess. Uh, yeah, it makes a triangle. Okay, so when you so here maybe in this triangle, this is vertex five, seven, and nine. Uh, so five seven nine comes so i want to make five and seven neighbor okay this vertex and this vertex neighbor but they may already have been neighbored before that is the important issue so you look at the you try to make v five and seven neighbor if you succeed then you add that new edge to your system otherwise if it is if they are already neighbor then this returns true, so you don't do anything further. So in the make words neighbor function here, for five, you look at whether seven is in my uh, vertex list, is my is in my uh, neighbor vertex list. If it if it is, then I just return true. I don't do any further action. If not, however, so five, seven is not in the vertex neighborhood of five then i notify five that seven is your new neighbor and vice versa i notify seven that five is your new neighbor and this handles your word list part as well as you can see and when you come back here i also add this edge from five to seven using my add edge function here so five and seven they make a new edge and i notify uh, we five words five that this new edge, whatever it is, maybe it is the 20th edge. Uh, this 20 is your 
at uh, in your neighborhood. Later on, when a second triangle like this triangle is inserted, is read in your system like this triangle below here. Uh, so this is five, seven, 10. Okay, let's call it vertex 10. So I will try to insert five and seven again because of this bottom triangle. And then when I call this make neighbor function, five, seven, it will return true, so I will do nothing. So this prevents duplication in my structure, which is very important. So this is the uh, only critical thing I can uh, talk about, like implementation wise. Uh, and once you set this up, you are good to go. You can now implement lots of cool graphics projects. So before closing this session, let me also show you that file formats we have been talking about like OFF. Uh, in the beginning, I have eight vertices for a cube. So vertex one, vertex two, blah, blah. These are 3D coordinates, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Uh, and below this format wants you to first specify the number of edges in the upcoming polygon. If it's a triangle, it will always be three as we see in this case, but it can be four, then you have a quadrangle. Sometimes three, sometimes four in the same file is also possible. Uh, so this tells you that connect four, zero, and three. So this is zero, three, and four. So these minus one, these two, as well as the top vertex here, maybe they make up this first triangle and you continue like that. And uh, we also uh, in our mesh files, we want this uh, consistency in our uh, index ordering, like 403. If I change it to 430, then I will see the back of this face, which will give a black uh, output here. It, and it is not very ple pleasing. So, if you go with the counterclockwise ordering, like you do in this example, you have to repeat it in every other triangle. Like here I provide P0, P2, P1. Okay, so 0, 2, 1 is the entry in the file. Then 2, 5, 1. Okay, 2, 5, 1. So, and this is coming from the right hand rule, if you recall. like. 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, P0, P2, P1, you uh, uh, point your right hand from P0 to P2 and then bend it towards P1 and the, your thumb sticks out of the screen then. Your thumb will be uh, the normal, like the uh, normal because looking out of the screen towards you. And you want that normal repeated around you, okay? So you don't want a sudden change in your normal. So if you had ordered it from two, one, five, then you use your right hand trick again. Uh, your hand from two to one is bent from one to five. Then your thumb sticks in the screen. So this is unpleasant, we don't want that. We want consistency. Um, and you don't do anything here, actually. This is your input file. So you hope that it comes uh, in a consistent clockwise or counterclockwise ordering. Uh, if it doesn't, then you may design an algorithm to fix it. But uh, by default, we expect this to be consistent. And one last thing before closing edge-based structure. So, so far we have kept faces explicitly. Uh, in edge-based alternative, uh, we can talk about, so this does everything you do with face-based actually, no, nothing special, but with the face-based, uh, when you access your wandering neighborhood, there is no order, okay? So it is arbitrary. Maybe this is the first one you visit, then this is the second, then this is the third. Okay, but with edge-based, 
it gives you an order. So it what I mean is from if this is the first neighbor, second will not be this one. Okay, with face base, it can be that one, especially with my implementation that I have shown you, because the, I don't keep any order in this neighborhood. But with edge based structure using half edges and uh, uh, using next and previous of these half edges, essentially you split each edge into two edges. Well, that's why I don't prefer this, but it enables you to go and back here, then go again, come back. So see you traverse your warning neighborhood in a uh, in a principled fashion, but not that critical. I should mention. Yeah, and these are the popular libraries. They come with uh, the their own implementations. So you have to feed your data into their format somehow. But again, if you use my uh, my own lightweight header file and cpp file then you won't be needing this stuff as well obviously this is i am not saying that these are bad things they offer you much more than just structure representation they also offer you algorithms this actually stands for computational geometry algorithms library so once you in the background it uses these half edges etc uh, but in as far as the services go they provide you like compute me the Voronoi diagram or Delonai triangulation of this point cloud, give me that mesh or compute the curvature information on this mesh, etc. So uh, they can be provided to you. You don't have to implement them from scratch. With that, I will stop uh, and uh, continue with other structures in the next class.